So, we'll begin now. Thank you for coming. So this talk's a road to open source, um, and it's pretty much my road to open source, and it's a road, it's not the road, right? There's many different roads. Um, this is being recorded, so I can share it with other people and put it on YouTube. If that's an issue with you, don't mention your name. <laughs> All right. Um, so who am I, and why should you listen to me? So I've done many things. Um, if I actually go up here, what the? This is interesting, All right? Um, so I'm one of the well, the most active open source developer in Australia. I created a tool called History.js, which is one of the top, I think, 40 JavaScript projects. Delp has one of the top 20 um, projects, uh, CoffeeScript projects, and Beverly is a company, um, but also mostly a community that I've created. We've that's a listing of all our projects, and these are all our different members as well, or our team members who actually contribute. Now, before I proceed further, um, we are at Hacker Retreat. They're a school. Um, goes for three months, students pretty much work on their own things, but there's mentors in there to help. I'm one of them, this case, and we have to say thank you to all the different sponsors as well. So now that that's done, you check out the sponsors, they're cool. Um, so now that that's done, we'll continue. So, um, but I've also done a bunch of other things. I started working with a blogging platform called B2Evolution many years ago, and that was my introduction to open source. I did a whole bunch of jQuery plugins. Um, probably, there's two which are really popular. One was like for hash changes, and the other one was um, a scroll to plugin, right? To scroll to a particular part of the page very smoothly. Um, I also worked on a project called Aloha Editor. Um, they allow you to use content editable to do not press the power button when you're doing a presentation. All right. Um, da, da, da. So these were the, actually the first people to do content editable. Um, do they not have a demo anymore? Demos. This is ridiculous. Okay, I guess it's that one then. What is this? All right, we can ignore that. But I was with them, um, so I think like 2012 I was with them. I'm mentor with Hackertree. I'm also involved in a project called Startup Hostel, a project called Interconnect, and a project, a recent project called Chainy.js. But what I'm really about is open collaboration, um, which is just helping people collaborate together. Our calling for Beverly is to actually enable everyone to do what they want, um, give it away to the entire world, and live a great life. So that's a pretty ambitious project. Now, why are we gathered here? Why do you guys actually care about this? So this is going to be valuable to you if you actually want your stuff to be used um, by other people. Um, you know, create a really popular open source project that's used by everybody. Um, if you want to be a request by company, so instead of having, you know, to go to companies that get work and so they come to you instead. If you want to also then survive the digital paparazzi, as your stuff becomes popular, you also get exposed to a lot of hate. And that's that's quite totally. Any person who's read YouTube comments will know that, right? Um, and also, how do you just generally stay sane when you're trying to juggle so many things at once? Now, there's also a few learnings here, right? Which is about what this path is about. So. I'm going to actually tell you these learnings at the beginning rather than at the end, so that way you can fill them up with a box, right? You can kind of realize what they're about. So the first one is success is a windy pass path. Windy and windy, probably equally accurate um, for both. Now, the idea with at least that one is it's okay to not know where you're going. Um, Steve Jobs said that very well in his keynote. Um, that he gave at Stanford where he says you can't connect the dots going forward, you can only connect them going backwards. And I found that to be true for myself. I've set out like on a goal and I'd be like, in five years this is going to happen. 
and it turned out to completely not be the case. And then I, at the beginning, I was just like, oh, Ben, you suck. You know, you didn't reach your goals. But at the same time, you know, through experience, I've realized, no, I've actually accomplished so much more and in a different, more applicable way. And this kind of ties a lot into the failure as being feedback. Now, all of these learnings are very basic. You've heard these like a thousand times. Um, but I have like a particular translation for each of these, which I found to be more applicable to myself because, you know, we've heard these and I've heard these and I ignored these for a very, very long time, right? So the failure is feedback one I found to be like failure is like a slap in the face. Um, the universe will like keep slapping you um, until you actually get the lesson. So at first it'll start off as like a little prod. Then it'll turn into like a shove. Then it'll turn into like a slap. Then it'll turn into like a truck, right? Um, so if you can learn when it's just a prod, then that's good. If you if it takes you for like a you know Mac truck, which it often does in like relationships, then that's also good. You still learn from it, right? Um, but if you're in that moment, it's hard to see that, right? But that's the thing. It's it's about feedback there. Now goals change, and that's okay. Now this is really more about um, you know if you set out a goal, a five year goal and it doesn't work out, it's more about that you needed more life experience, right? It, it was a pretty broad, it was a bit amorphous, right? It, it maybe not have been um, that precise about what you wanted. So initially, like, there was a project that I set out to do um, called Idea Share, right? Like, this open collaboration thing, like, I've only been able to tie that to open collaboration very recently, um, maybe, like, two years ago or a year ago. Um, but before that, I used to think, hey, open source is what I want to do. Then it was like, you know, very broad. Then I was like, I don't know, I want to help people like work on ideas. A bit, a bit less broad. And then, okay, I want to get people to actually feel um, connected to something um, and actually be able to help each other out. A bit less broad. And then, okay, what I want is actually for people to be able to collaborate with each other, right? And each of these is like a, a failed experiment along the way, right? And then I've narrowed it more to what I want. And this kind of happens where like growth happens outside the comfort zone. Um, now we've heard that a million times, but I think the lesson there when it comes applicable to life is that you need to push the boundaries on both sides to be able to figure out where the middle ground is, right? Um, in my own life, through personal experiences, one I'll probably share is um, I have I grew up with a, with a rule, don't criticize something unless I've tried it. I actually applied that to drugs. And so like I was like, ah, oh, but then I'll try it. And you know, through that experience and I actually learned maybe drugs aren't a good idea, right? But at least this gives me the perspective um, that, you know, now I know that middle ground and I know where the boundaries are at for my own life, right? I know where my limits are at. And you can't know where your limits are at if you didn't push past them. And also, you must be ready for growth. If you are going to attempt to change the world, or attempt to do these different things, or if you are trying to be slapped, you have to make sure that you're ready for the new lesson. You can't go change your entire life if you're not ready for that change. Um, this is something I've learned in a, in a few different ways, very stubborn about it, um, but this path will, will provide that. Now, most importantly, um, this is like the big lesson at the end that I want to at least if I can get everyone to kind of feel a bit, a bit strong about this Then I'll be happy right because as least if you get this lesson um, Or like you come to this lesson then I think your life will greatly improve as it did for mine so firstly um, What's my journey and why do we actually need these lessons, right? Like I can tell you about, hey, you know, these lessons are great, they'll improve your life. But if you don't actually have a need for them, you're not going to apply them to your own life. Um, so what were the need for these? How did I actually come across this? So in 1997, when I was like 7 slash 8 years old, I actually started programming. Um, and since then, like I've been programming like every single year um, since then. So I did HTML, CSS, and Java. Actually, there wasn't JavaScript really then. Like, so it was HTML and CSS, and we did like a website as part of like an extracurriculum activity for school. Um, it was like a website for Perth, like the, the town I grew up in. And it used frames and iframes, right, if anyone remembers those. And we actually won an award um, for it. 
and it was really good and then all the servers like crashed and in those days they didn't have backups so everything was lost right um so that was really interesting but i was hooked the the teacher was amazing and he kind of said like you know you guys are the future and and that it's so important that you guys stay strong and you stay committed and you stay thinking differently um because so often in life you're going to just get you know drilled down and hammered but if you keep that fire ignited then that's very good so I, all my life i've had really great teachers which is something that i've only realized kind of looking back as well when i compare it to like other people now in 2006 i actually started freelancing um, and i also started attending university so that's like at the age of 16 and 17. Um, now here this is also like when j3 rose to fame um and this is also when i started coding j3 plugins and it's also when i started working with v2 evolution so i didn't know that much about really programming i was more doing c and c sharp in the back end um and i didn't really care that much about web development but then i had another great teacher and he said ben i think you're gonna love web development i i see that and i was just like screw it i want to write video games so that sounds awesome because i really enjoy video games as any teenage person probably would um but yeah i, I started doing web development and, and it was really fascinating but b2 evolution was really the change here um if we go up to it oh if not the url this is such an interesting way to do it all right b2 evolution so it's kind of like wordpress so originally wordpress was from a project called b2 and B2 split in two directions. It split to WordPress and it split to B2 Evolution. Um, and the original maintainer um, crowned WordPress as the official successor, hence why WordPress got the popularity. When B2 Evolution focused more for developers and extensibility. Now, I used this and I started blogging very crappily. Luckily, none of those blog posts are actually online anymore um, because they were very immature. Um, but at least, you know, I started writing plugins from, for that platform and I started really understanding the importance of community. Whenever I had a question, there was great people to actually help out and help me. And in turn, I learned how you're meant to respect the community. You're also meant to make it feel as if everybody can do anything, like you're king and you can or queen and you can accomplish whatever you want, right? And I really felt that way in that community. So that's something like I took and applied without realizing it to all my other work. Whenever I published a jQuery plugin, I really tried my best to make sure that people could use it and, and implement it, and I provided great support. But then in around 2009, if I go back, oh my gosh. All right, there we go. <laughs> That's a bit easier. Um, I realized um, through my freelancing that I was only really writing PHP to actually do JavaScript. It was just one of those moments where it's just like, look, there's something about my consulting I don't actually enjoy. Um, and I really like looked inside and trying to figure out what it was. And it's just more that I was just writing PHP so I could do JavaScript. And as soon as I did that, like I just felt so much happier. I didn't have to deal with the back end stuff um, really. And the type of work engagements I actually did changed. Um, so, in around this, I also really started immersing myself with Ajax. I started evaluating, like, how do we actually build safe web applications, and I immersed myself into that. And it's really fortunate, because in 2011, two years later, I ended up creating a project called HistoryJS. This project actually came about because through my two years of experience looking at stateful web applications, I attended a meetup, because in Perth, there, there was maybe a tech community of like 30 people when I was growing up, right? So we finally, had, there was a meetup I was aware of, I attended it, and a person called Keith Pitt um, presented on the history API, which allowed websites to finally update the URL directly. So instead of like doing a hash thing like this, instead you could actually modify the URL rather than just hashes. So that was really exciting because it solved the SEO problems of websites, which Ajax broke. Um, so when I actually attended that, I realized, hey, other people are actually having the same issues that I've had, and I've got a wealth of experience. Um, how about I actually create another project to actually address these issues? And one of my biggest problems has been figuring out 
um, other people actually share the same issue, right? Like, at least when you're starting off, you can really think that the only people who actually change things are like the really popular ones, like the wizards. Like, say, when I was growing up, it was 37 signals, right? Like you read this stuff and you kind of idolize them a bit, right? And you're like, wow, these people are amazing. And you think that you have to be of that caliber to actually change something. When really, if you just have like a good depth of knowledge about something and other people are having that issue, you can change something. So I wrote History JS in about maybe, I think, four days or three days. I just kind of, I stayed at the office. They had an open office policy you could attend for free at that company called the Frontier Group. And I just stayed there and I coded out History JS. And pretty much within like two weeks, it became incredibly popular. Like it got, I think, 2,000 stars on GitHub. And back then, like that was a lot, right? Um, so that was really interesting as well. I also did like a few things about publicity where I posted on Stack Overflow like everywhere. I just searched for anything that mentioned hash change or history API. And I was just like, history JS, amazing, it's really good. But I answered them in ways that actually address the problem, right? Like I actually spent like maybe a week actually, you know, saying this is why it's good, this is why it's bad. And I wrote a, um, an actual article for history JS. Um, if we go to the wiki, Intelligent state handling. So instead of really posting like um, in each answer why people should use history JS, I just did up this wiki page. So it starts off with like, you know, why people started using the hash bank. Then people started using like hashes and then eventually um, all the different problems and then why the HTML5 history API is the solution um, and why hash bangs were completely crap. So I, I put that, you know, I linked that with the Stack Overflow answers and things like that, but there's this added to it to become really popular, but the, the reason why this worked was that it made HistoryJS an intro project, right? So if people wanted to build stateful web applications, HistoryJS provided everything they needed to get started, provided them with the foundations. In the same way, if you're wanting to do web development, um, jQuery is a great starting point because it's an intro project to interactive JavaScript on, on the front end. So HistoryJS was one of these intro projects to um, stateful web applications. So if you are going to create like an open source project and it is something that does require fundamental change of thinking, if people have been going about it in like the wrong way in a very long time, you need to really put a lot of effort into convincing them that their way is wrong and do it not in like a way that you are wrong, you suck, blah, 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 but actually say, you know, this way wasn't that good, here's a better way, this is the reasons why. So this is probably a very worthwhile article to read, it's still a bit relevant. Um, what is still relevant It's like a piece of history, I guess, right? Um, now, from history jazz, I, I actually came to learn um, a bit hard Right, it became so ridiculously popular um, so quickly. I got like, I would have thought that, hey, this is going to provide all my bills and this is going to pay for my life. And like, 37 signals used it in Basecamp, right? And like, that's huge. Like, this is like the biggest project of like those days of like a web application. And yet, the only thing I got was like publicity, right? I didn't actually get any financial returns or any rewards. But at the same time, um, at the end of the year, I actually moved over to Sydney to be with my then girlfriend, now wife. Um, and things actually changed because this decision to, to focus on JavaScript full time put me in a very unique position because no one else was doing that, um, especially that early in the game. So when I came to Sydney, people were like, hey, you did History Jest, that's really popular, we use it, it's really great. Hey, you do JavaScript consulting, we need a JavaScript expert. And this door opened up and I, and I was able to secure um, some really good work. Initially for the first two months, like I worked on a startup, I earned about, I, it was originally quoted at $40 now, but it really turned out to be like 18 or 20, which I actually took back after the hours were done, right? But I made sure that even if I was getting like, you know, not that much money from it, I still provided a complete commitment. I sort of gave them 110%. Their testimonials and their referrals, actually allowed me to then land a job which then provided a, a revenue of $91,000 a year. This is really big because before then, since 2006, I had just been earning a peak of like $18,000 a year, right, through my financing. So it's a huge, a huge improvement. 
Whoops. Ah! All right, that's okay. I have enough battery. Um, yeah, so that was really great. And, and at the same time, I created a project called DocPad. Um, at that point, it was just a proof of concept. It, it wasn't really anything more. And I also incorporated a company called Beverly. Now, at that point, Beverly was just a consultancy, and, and it's grown over time, right? And we'll cover that a bit later. So then, you know, I was working for a medical contract, um, a government contract, and I was earning a lot of money, and I was really interested in that. And then from that, um, let's see, create, da, 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 start up, start up, join. Yep, we're okay, right? Now, I ended up joining another company, and like the, this, the success of my publicity just kept growing, right? Um, because history just continued getting popular. DocPad started getting a little bit more popular. And my testimonials of my consulting work just kept getting better and better and better. And I ended up securing a job with a company called Bugherd, a startup. And I was able to work for like open source pretty much full time then. So I was doing JavaScript. I was doing amazing stuff with, with Backbone.js. I coded like a... Uh, a query engine um, for it to do NoSQL queries on the client side and it did like a, a really bunch of awesome um, stuff to be really performant. Um, that's on like the Beverly website, you can check it out. And But eventually like I, I worked so hard and, and so well and I got all these testimonials, I, like, I deprecated myself from that company, right? Like it was just like, hey, I've trained all the new employees, I've done everything you can. And really, there's nothing here left that requires my expertise. So at the end, they were keeping me on just to do like junior um, development, right? So then I was like, guys, this isn't working. I'm going to leave. And I had built up enough savings, about $40,000 in about those nine months um, of consulting, of the high profile consulting. So we spent about six months um, and we actually worked through all of our, our savings, the $40,000. And I did get offers, but they were all work that didn't really align with me at all. And, I, and I've always held that with me, like have a really good integrity um, where I will only accept work if it does align. And that too is a lesson, right? Because when you start off consulting, you have to realize to say no to some clients, right? Because if you, if you say yes to everyone, you're going to say yes to the bad ones. Uh, or not really the bad ones, just the ones that don't align for you, the ones where you're not the good fit, right? The ones where you're the square in the triangle hole. When if you do say no to enough people, then you can say yes to the one that actually is a great fit. So I ended up completely broke and that kind of sucked. And when you have a, a, a girlfriend or maybe a wife at that stage, um, and two stepchildren, it's pretty intense, right? So it did weigh down a lot on my mental stability. And eventually, like I, I promised to Helen um, that, you know, we are going to find some work that is going to be okay. And it really did change my focus because like this entire time we're focusing on, we don't want to be broke. And sure enough, we became broke. And then as soon as like the, the shift happened, where I was just like, you know, I'm definitely going to bring in the money, right? Our focus changed and then instead of not being broke into actually bringing in, you know, a good amount of money, right? And then from there, I started calling up like all my friends and this network I had built over time. And someone who discovered me through HistoryJS, um, and he's followed me on Twitter for a while and we've really gotten along, um, he heard, you know, about this situation where I said, you know, really in need of some work. And he reached out to me and he said, look, Ben, I, you know, I've heard you're, you're not in a good place. How much do you actually need to get by? And I said, like, okay, you know, for at least a month, maybe like four thousand or two thousand um, dollars, just to get by until we can probably land some more work. And he's like, alrighty. Um, and how long do you think it will actually take for you to land some work, right? If I help you out and everything like that, and give you some suggestions. I mean, it shouldn't be more than maybe four weeks. And I was like, yeah, that's probably right. So then he's like, alright, Ben, don't worry about the money. I'll forward it to you tomorrow. Um, and we'll find some work for you. And this entire time, right, I was just so concerned and so worried about bringing in this money or not going broke. And all I had to do was just like ask for help. And this network I had built accidentally through HistoryJS, which I was so resentful for, actually provided this connection, right, to actually get me out of this. And at that time, I was trying to be like, what the hell just happened? Like, why did this happen? Why did this change of perspective actually impact my life so much? And I started looking into a person called Eckhart Tolle. 
Um, and he teaches like a concept called presence, it's also called mindfulness, it's also called um, a bunch of other things. But it's like the practice of meditation, um, but you can apply it to like any moment in your life. So I started really researching that um, a lot and I started really investing more in personal development to try and understand, um, you know, what kind of went down. And taking away like there from the lessons, right, if I look back for that year, it did say, you know, perspective is important. You should have like a mindset of what you want rather than what you don't want. Um, and life will kind of turn out pretty good for you, right, even if it is bad. Now, sure enough, next year, um, well, in 2013, this is interesting, right? Because I have, there's a point in there that I didn't meet. That sponsorship, I'll get to it, right? So anyway, um, I ended up landing some work and that lasted from maybe like November to March or so, um, some consultancy work um, through that. And all I really had to do was like, I presented a training at a company. So like, you know, I reached out, I used my network um, and I did a training and then someone in the audience was like, hey Ben, you know, you seem like you know what you're talking about. I need a JavaScript developer. Can you implement some stuff for me? And I said, yeah, sure, I, I can do that. Um, and that worked really well. Now in the end, that project actually failed abysmally um, in about March, but you know, I maintained a good, a good attitude about it and you know, we were very open and very upfront and very candid about the entire thing, right? It did fail, but we had a contract in place, we had our expectations in place. And we both were very respectful about that project failing. It didn't work out. Sometimes that happens. In hindsight, that was life slapping me, right? Before it was like a prod earlier on, and then that became a slap. And the next year after that, it actually became like a full smack drop, right? I didn't get that lesson I needed. Now, in that time as well, in that off time after that consulting job, I started working on DocBed. I had nothing else to do, and I knew that things were going to be okay. I had actually gotten that lesson from going broke the previous time um, that if I focus on the success, if I know it's all going to be okay, even if we lose all our money, we're still going to have our health, we're still going to be alive, it's still going to be fine, right? And to actually say that, like, I don't mind living on the street, it's, I'm sure I'll make that work and make that fun, is interesting, right? Because in this Western society, we're so told that we need a house, we need all of this accumulation, and yet that's not true because you go to any other culture, especially like say the nomads in Mongolia, they don't care about those things, all they have is each other. Um, so the, the way of life in Western culture can distort our perspectives to think it's the only way of life, when there's plenty of people without all the things we have living great and happy lives. And so. You know, I knew it was all going to be okay, and I did get that lesson, right? That's a weird sound, isn't it? Right? So, and it was okay. Um, when we actually started going broke, I applied the same lessons. I started reaching out to people, and someone completely out of the blue messaged me, and they said, hey, Ben, you know, we realize you need some money. Um, and we use DocPad. We absolutely love it. Um, how would you like to fly over to Toronto and we'll cover your life expenses? And if it works out, we'll, we'll continue that arrangement. So I flew over to Toronto. There was a company called My Planet Digital that happily came there. And I trained the, the staff in using DocPad. And I worked with the guy there um, to kind of create a GUI for it to make DocPad more applicable to the clients. My Planet is one of the biggest web development consultancy companies in. Canada, they do work for Fortune 500 companies, and it was really cool because now I actually see like a company culture that really scaled quite largely, that was really successful. Like it showed me that hey, you know, open source can interact with with big companies successfully. So that worked really well. Um, I love Toronto. I, I love that consultancy, and they just decided, yep. Yeah, you know, this is working out really well. So they continued to pay my, my life salary um, for about an entire year. Um, I was allowed to work on whatever I wanted. They just paid me um, 6,000 USD a month, which is, you know, what we needed. And I was able to do more consultancy and trainings on the side to just bring in a little bit extra. Um, in that year, 
I actually did like a whole bunch of things. Um, I went to India, I presented um, a talk about, you know, just my learnings at that time. I presented at a university in India about open source. I flew to Bali to set up a project called Startup Hostel and I helped a company there to um, change their one month retreat into a full time retreat. I um, also, what did I do at the end? I attended Hacker Retreat um, as a mentor. Um, and, you know, when, when your life, you don't have to worry about money and you have someone providing a salary for you, it really just allows you to learn a lot. But at the same time, I didn't get that lesson that I needed, right? Um, so in 2014, um, are we okay? I know. <laughs> right. Yeah. I will just pause this for a moment because it just complained about I'm not having enough file space on my computer. All right, so just had to pause there, but now we're back. So yeah, in 2014, um, it came about and there was a serious failure in my life. Um, and I didn't get that, that lesson earlier. That started off as a prod, then like a shove, and now it's like that Mac truck. So what happened um, in a very quick eight weeks, um, I sliced my finger open like horrifically. Um, I like I was going to do the dishes and like the the I, it slipped out of my hand and like the bowl broke and it sliced open my finger and like I couldn't type for like four weeks. Right then at the same time I became incredibly sick. I got like a virus and I um I couldn't. You know, I was puking the entire time and I was really bad as well. And at the same time, um, the sponsorship for um, DocPad cut out as well, right? So I had no, you know, no way of earning money. I had, and I literally was like bedridden for, for the better part of eight weeks, right? So um, that was the Mack truck. So like, you know, doing the lessons I had earlier, I actually posted... You know, I, 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 you know, I was pretty much mopey for about four weeks, right? Like, it was really, really sad. It's all right. <laughs> but, um, um, and then after that, you know, I started applying the lessons I had in my life. And I ended up posting um, a very interesting GitHub issue. So, Dogpad issues. And it's called, very military style, Operation Disassemble and Diversify. It's become more and more evident to myself that I have failed to, to successfully delegate responsibility of DocPad out to other people, right? And it kind of goes in a bit and about all the ways that I've actually screwed up um, in maintaining this project. And it's interesting, right, because when we read the comments, everyone's saying, you know, everyone as well, they, they don't, to some extent, right, they see, but as a maintainer of a project, um, you know, you have a lot of foresight that other people just can't have. So I realized um, the lesson that I didn't get. And a lesson of why that project failed um, earlier was that I kind of overestimated what I could accomplish myself. Um, I hadn't yet reached my limits of what I could do personally, and this this was that that smack. I had finally reached the limits of what I could actually accomplish by myself, and that was flipping hard, right? So, at least when it came to Dockpad, I built this amazing thing. We had like 500 daily users at that time. It's even more now. Um, and, you know, provide a great income for me and a great network and a great community of people. But at the time, I actually failed to empower everyone to actually maintain the core. Everyone's writing plugins. We had like over 150 plugins for it. Um, but everyone still had a report to myself. I was still the bottleneck of this project. As much as I tried to solve that with History.js, it was still the case. So I've, I got like a bunch of learnings from it, um, from HistoryJS, but I got even more learnings this time around. Um, so the other project, the consultancy one, you know, I thought I could accomplish this and really I needed a team for it. Um, and now we know that, right? 
And the other aspect to this is disassemble. This is more a, a computer um, or a computer science concept, right? If I can build these tiny little pieces and abstract them out, then that's actually a lot more maintainable than this gigantic big piece that takes maybe like six months to learn. If I can just create these tiny little pieces that can be finalized for, for the rest of you know, eternity, then people only need to learn the actual bit that's relevant to themselves rather than everything else. So it was interesting, right, because we had here and then, surprisingly, the community was supportive as they always are. Um, I find I've come to underestimate other people and overestimate myself when it really should be the other way around. You should probably underestimate yourself and overestimate, actually, no, right? You should expect, be humble about your own skills, right, but you should also know that people can accomplish amazing things if you let them. So since then, I've applied a lot of changes um, to the way I do things. So if we go back, this is where that shift occurred, right? Um, I started looking for work, but this time not as a freelancer, this time joining a team. I realized, you know, I couldn't do everything by myself. I needed a team of other people I could really learn from. And it was interesting as well, right, because I applied for a few companies, and I got hit and requested by a few companies as well. And the integrity thing came up because I, some companies wanted me to sign NDAs and that's something I'm completely against, right? It, it doesn't align with me as well at all because of the open collaboration values. Um, so I kept saying no and it got, you know, to a very interesting point. And then eventually some of my network said, we have work for you. Um, and it turned out to be a really good role. The guy's really supportive and it's provided some interesting lessons, right? And I've realized for the focus of my work, you know, in the tech scene, I've got those lessons, you know, create something that is disassembled and create a diverse team. But as well, if you do create an amazing project, you have to train people to use it. One of my friends now, he jokes about, Ben, you've already solved the world's problems, but no one knows about your stuff, right? So I need to train people in that, right? I need to get them exposed to it. So that's what I'm going to dedicate my life now to. So hopefully in 2020, I have a hotel in Fiji dedicated to open collaboration. That's on the Beverly website. I'm very adamant about that. So finally, how do I actually apply these lessons, Ben? You know, that's nice to hear about your life, but how do I apply it to my own? So practically, diversify your team or diversify just everything, right? Um, and this is something that I've realized applies to every category, not just like just tech, it, it applies to all of your life. You need, um, and it's interesting because if you become so focused on one thing, right, you narrow your perspective, and then if you become aware of something outside of that, then bang, right, all these assumptions you've made may be incorrect. It's important to have a broad scope, but at the same time, it's important to have like a deep depth of understanding about your actual area, but at the same time, you have to be open to other things. This is showing very much about how we approach tech now. Um, you know, we understand now that, you know, you, you can't hit a, a nail with a hammer. Like, you know, how does that metaphor actually go? When you have a hammer, everything you see is a nail, right? That's not um, precisely true because that hammer is only going to be successful hitting the niche of a nail that is designed to do better than anybody else. Right? If you're trying to hit a nail on an area that you don't hit it the best, that you're going to fail there. Or rather, you don't deserve to succeed there because it's not going to be the best solution. Um, now, I covered those first two, but the last part is really important because I see this so often. People will go through, through the life and... Th at least for myself, I push the boundaries in every single way, much to the the testament of my wife at times, but she's always been supportive because she understands the way I work. Um, but I've always kind of decided, you know, what is the life I want to create? And I haven't altered on that and I haven't faulted on that. Um, it's more about, you know, what is the, the vision of this world I'm wanting to pursue and how do I accomplish that? And if you pursue that, the universe does tend to care about you, it seems. It will slap you. It will give you a Mack truck if you need it. Um, but it's there just to give you a lesson. Um, and it will be okay in the end. Sometimes it doesn't seem that way, but 
you know, I'm still around. But at the same time, it's flipping hard, right? Um, so these days I do ask for a lot of help and that's something that this training thing has kind of showed me as well. I've underestimated people previously and I have to give them the, the amazing ability that they do have and actually open up. Um, Isaac Schluter, the core maintainer of NPM, was one of the first people to actually show me this. When I was broke before, the first time I was broke, you know, I was like, how the hell do you, do you say no to work and, and you know, still maintain your sanity? And he says, Ben, you, you're good at what you do, you'll find a job. And I was just like, how do you trivialize this so much? This is important. But he was a lot wiser than me then, <laughs> right? Um, and he too has been opening up about a lot of these personal struggles that, that you know, you go through and it's great to see and, and it's inspiring me to do the same. So I'll end it there. Um, so I'm Ben, that's the link to my website. Please follow me um, if you like me. If you don't like me, let me know nicely, otherwise I'll cry. Um, but I'm always trying to improve and I hope this has showed and I hope that's been valuable to anyone listening. Um, now I will have to stop this for questions because I'm gonna run out of space, but we can take the questions offline. So thank you very much and thanks. All right.